Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to today's Live Inspired podcast episode. So glad that you're here with me today, and I'd love to stay connected with you all week long. Could you use a little inspiration beyond just this podcast? If you could, I hope you can, connect with me. I'm very active on social media, sharing positive, actionable thoughts and videos and posts about what could be inspiring to you right this moment. So find me on Facebook by searching John O'Leary Live Inspired. My Instagram handle is johnoleary.inspires. Or if you're hanging out on Twitter, the handle there is at J-O-Leary Inspires. Anywhere that you are on social media, we are hanging out as well. And we are sharing news that is elevating for you in your work, in your relationships, and in your life. I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, thank you, Joe Buck, and welcome, my friends, to the Live Inspired Podcast and the Live Inspired Movement. So here we go, a question on the front side. I'm going to go through a whole long list of names, and I want you to tell me what the one thing they have in common is, okay? So sit back, buckle up, get ready for the ride. Princess Diana, Walt Disney, Elton John, Oprah Winfrey, Owen Wilson, Halle Berry, Johnny Cash, Tina Turner, Drew Carey, Vanilla Ice, Ice Ice Baby, Ken Griffey Jr., Shelley Long, Drew Barrymore, and the list goes on and on and on from there. What is the one thing that these luminaries have in common? These individuals, these leaders in their respective fields have all at one point or another in their past attempted to take their own life. And they are far from alone in this. The CDC reports that in 2016, 1.3 million Americans, not global, just in America alone, 1.3 million Americans attempted to take their own life. That number continues to rise year after year after year, unfortunately and tragically, and nearly 45,000 individuals lost their life in 2016 due to suicide. In fact, it's a 10th leading cause of death. A person takes his or her life worldwide every 40 seconds, every 40 seconds, unbelievable. And in 2020, if this rate continues, it's expected that it will then be every 20 seconds, someone will take their own life. Well, today's guest has a story about this. Today's guest has an example about this. Today's guest has a way forward about this topic. The more I learn about Desiree's stage, the more I'm inspired, not only by what she's been through, but what she's doing about it going forward. So my friends, I'm not gonna share with you today a whole lot of Desiree's story. I'm gonna instead share with you a whole lot more about the profound work she's doing, the reasons for it, and the life-giving example that she is. So Desiree, stage, welcome, my friend, to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Hey. Thank you for having me. It is an honor and your work is worthy. I'm going to give it just a little bit of context. In 2005, you graduated from East Tennessee State University with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology, and then you continued research in suicide research. Uh, talk about your interest in that background and that specialty. Yeah, um, my interest in suicide probably goes back to um, being 14 or 15 and um getting hit with depression for the first time, losing uh, a friend to suicide for the first time, and just kind of realizing at that point, like, this is what I want to do with my life. And so, you know, I followed the academic path because I thought that was what made the most sense. Um, Mm -hmm. You were told to go to college. So I was like, well, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to study suicide. And um, it turned out that that was not easy. Um, Mm. people were not super interested in a young person, uh, delving so deeply into that topic. And I kept getting told, you know, you got to go to grad school. You got to, you got to wait till grad school to, to research suicide. So I did what I could in the meantime, toward the end of my undergraduate career, I did have a professor who was very encouraging. So in his lab, I worked on 
some self-injury research. They're not exactly the same, but there there are often intersections. I got trained in crisis intervention. I volunteered very briefly at a crisis hotline, and I applied to a PhD program. And at that point, I I got into a PhD program. I attempted suicide right around the same time myself. It was just a really messy, messy time for me, uh, those early 20s. <laughs> when you attempted suicide yourself and when you're doing the research and you're learning more about this individually and globally, as you then are looking for resources to help guide folks afterwards, what are you learning? It's funny. The, the research path didn't, didn't pan out for me back then. Um, I got to the PhD program and I was told, you know, we don't, we're, we're not really on board with this. So I, I ended up going in a different direction. But now, several years later, 12 years, 14 years after, after mm-hmm. I graduated from college, now I think we are more open to talking about suicide as a, a culture, um, more open to doing research about suicide, more open to including people who have been affected personally um, on both a loss level and a, a personal experience level. And, you know, I think what we're learning mainly is that this happens more often than we think. Yes. So Desiree, you may you may not know, but I do a, a fair amount of speaking around the country and around the globe. Afterwards, there's a line that frequently will form, and people will come up and will hug and shake hands, and and then and then it begins like this: John, it's not like your story, but and then they go into it, and I, I can't tell you how frequently that but is followed by a an example of someone in their own life who either attempted suicide or lost their life uh, to suicide, or they themselves made the attempt. I'm curious why, two things. (laughs) This is a hard question to answer, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. It seems like it's rising almost exponentially. Why is that? I think we hurt. I think we're all in pain. I think we invalidate pain. I think we wanna blame suicide on mental illness when suicide is more about adversity and trauma. I think we don't support each other enough. You know, there, I think there are, are numerous answers to that question and, and there's, there's not a one size fits all answer. In researching and preparing for today's conversation, I actually noticed that in, in your own writings that you said many of us think that it's related to a, a diagnosis and the reality is it's much more common to be an inflection point after a, a severe event after a massive adversity. Talk about that for a moment. Yeah. For, for a long time, we thought that it was that the suicide and mental illness were, were married, I'd say. Um, but CDC came out with a report last year saying that between 1999 and 2016, 54% of the people who took their lives in the United States did not have a mental health diagnosis. And, you know, of course, that could partially be due to the fact that maybe they hadn't sought out care. Mm-hmm. But what we were also finding is that, yeah, like you said, big life events took people down a path to suicide. So that's like breakups, job loss, legal issues, financial issues, uh, things that that we don't necessarily link to suicide. Um, Breakups are a huge one. But, you know, when you lose the most important person in your life, sometimes you don't know what to do or, or how to cope with that or you lose your house. You don't know how to cope with that. There are, are, are so many different different paths leading to suicide, and, and they're all kind of laden with pain and confusion and hopelessness and futility. We don't need to go into the path that led you to that decision, but I'm very curious about the path that led you forward from it, because I think many of us have had an experience of, of desperation and then wondered, Can I take the next step forward? Am I worthy? Is it possible? And you at one point or another in your past decided, yes, like I'm, I'm going to move forward in life. What what led you to so boldly (laughs) move from one decision into a radically different one? It's funny. I I have to make that decision frequently. I am lucky to, to experience chronic suicidal thoughts. I've, I've attempted two times in my life. And the one time that I remember the, the thing that made me change my mind, I guess. Or, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't know that I changed my mind. I guess I found my value in a, a desperate moment. I was in an abusive relationship and I just thought, you know, if I don't change everything about my life right now, I am I will die. And it will probably be by my own hands. So 
It did. I walked away from my whole life mm. and everything changed and it didn't get better quickly. It took years to get better, but things changed slowly and, and they did get better and then they got worse and then they got better. You know, I went through a divorce many years later and I was there again. And then I don't know, other things happened and I was there again. And then sometimes the wind blows the wrong way. And I'm like, you know, maybe it would be better if I just weren't here. Uh, and that's, right. that's kind of how suicidal thoughts work for me and a lot of people I know. But you're constantly making that choice to, to live. And for me, you know, the past couple of years of my life specifically have been all about kind of affirming that choice to live every day. And it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work, and and you're not only making this for yourself and your family, you're inspiring an entire community to do likewise. And and I want to pivot into that now. I know, you know, the media seems to focus, and public attention seems to focus on people who died from suicide rather than those who lived to tell the tale afterwards. And then along steps Desiree Stage. Tell us about live through this this movement that you've begun. Live through this. All right. So I started Live Through This in 2010. Live Through This is a series of portraits and true stories of suicide attempt survivors across the United States. What I found when I started doing research toward toward this end, you know, I started it as a personal photography project because I went from academia to living in New York and being very confused about what my path forward should be. Um, I picked up a camera and that was my coping skill. And then it later became my career. But I was looking for a personal project and I immediately went back to this idea of suicide. You know, what can I do with my art to address suicide? And I immediately thought, well, I've attempted suicide, but I don't really, I don't know anybody else who has or who talks about it. You know, what what does that mean? Where are they? And so I started Googling and I didn't even know, I didn't even know what to Google. I was like, well, I guess I would be a suicide survivor. So I typed that in. And what I was finding were what we're now calling suicide loss survivors, people who, yes. have, who have lost a, a friend or family member to suicide. And I was like, where, where are the people who, who this has personally affected? And so I, I decided that would be my focus. What I was finding in the media were, you know, when there would be stories about suicide that were, you know, that told the story, um, it would be, Point A, something terrible happened. I attempted suicide. I lived and everything is better forever. And that wasn't true to my experience. So I wanted to explore that. Uh, and and that's, that's what I've done with Live Through This. You know, I sit down with, with attempt survivors and I say, just tell me your story. You know, leave in what you want to leave in, take out what you want to take out. But tell me what's important to you about this experience. Is that conversation usually lasts two hours? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, it, it is. It's a and it's always a really good, fulfilling conversation. Um, and we come out on the other end laughing, and then I make a portrait of them. You know, after sharing that, usually with a stranger. I a lot of the time I am a stranger to that person, so I think it's really telling because you know we've looked away from suicide for so long. And now I'm asking you and they're asking you as the viewer to look into their eyes. Uh, wow. And I think that's pretty incredible. Do you remember the first set of eyes that you looked into where you were able to hear a story uh, from this perspective? I do. My friend, Nicole, she was the first brave one. And at the beginning of the project, was it moved very slowly. But with Nicole, I thought, well, I want this to be a really kind of beautiful, well-lit studio Mm -hmm. <laughs> piece of work, body of work. Um, so if you if you find Nicole on the website, she's the only one on a black background, a nice little catch light in her hair, nice catch light in her eyes, and her expression is very intense. I looked at this portrait afterwards and I was like, I love it, but it's too dark. This isn't what I want from this project. Mm. <laughs> and so I, I, I just redid, reworked the whole idea. And now... When I when I make portraits of of people, I make portraits of them in the world that they try to take themselves out of. Wow. I use natural light, keep them outside. You know, sometimes you can see people walking by in the background or a car in the background. And you know that that that's kind of a, a process decision that most people don't know about in the work, but it's it's important to me. Can you share? You know, th these these pictures and their stories are all shared online. 
And in preparing for this, I read darn near every one of them, many of them with tears in my eyes. I, I just could not believe, first of all, how many you had, how beautiful their images are. I mean, these are just, these are beautiful men and women. They're just beautiful people. And, uh, and their stories, so tragic and so redemptive. Are there any stories from, from this movement that you have captured that just, I know they all moved you deeply, Desiree, but are there any that just shook you? Uh, yeah, there are, there are a lot of stories that I, I walk away from. One of the earliest ones was, was my friend Krista. And I think what, what, what shook me about it was that I met her in New York we both lived in New York, and I didn't know, I don't think, when I sat down with her, that we grew up a couple of miles from each other. We went to the same elementary school in Miami, had a lot of the same teachers. I think we even went to the same high school, if I recall. <laughs> and our paths were so parallel, and yet we never met each other. And at that point, so early on in the project, I thought that if I were to share my own story, that I would muddy the work. You know, I wasn't thinking about, I'm in every one of these pieces. I'm in the interview. I'm in the portrait because I'm, I'm you know, some of, the, some of the pictures, the people are smiling and it's because I made them laugh. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm in, I'm in it everywhere. And I didn't realize that back mm -hmm. then. So I listened to Krista's story and I got on the train home and I just sobbed, you know. I was like, oh, I got to. I've got to tell my story or this isn't real. Mm. You know, it's not, it's not right. So hers was the first one that really, really got me. And I think she might have been the fourth or fifth person I interviewed. And I've interviewed 186 people now. But then, you know, later, you just fall in love with people. I fall, I've fallen in love with, with almost all of these people. And for me, right now, the ones that really stick with me are um, the losses. It took, it took six years to lose somebody to suicide from this, this community. I knew that it was coming. Statistically, the more people who, who get involved, you know, the, the higher the, the chances that someone might die. Natalie Medina was the first person to die by suicide from the project. She was also someone I had a really great connection with. I remember I interviewed her in Eugene, Oregon, and she came and sat down and told me this really harrowing story but at the end we were making plans to hang out again next time I came to visit she was really into cigars and and, and riding and uh, she was like we should go out and drink and smoke cigars and I was like <laughs> okay I'll do that with you <laughs> I'm not into cigars but let's do it um you know and and she was just a great conversationalist and and so warm such an incredible human to lose her was was very difficult because she's, she was a person who tried everything. Yes. She went to therapy. She did all the stuff that we tell people to do. She reached out. She had a community. She, after sharing her story for Live Through This, became an advocate. You know, she was on the front page of the local newspaper. She was involved. And yet, she ended up dying by suicide. To me, that was just so heartbreaking because it's like if you if you did everything yes and what could have saved you you know and people call it tragic and it is but on the flip side she lived for i believe 53 years and her first traumatic experience was when she was seven or eight she witnessed a murder she lived all that time she woke up every single day for all those years and found a way to get through so to me, her story is, is, is one of triumph and strength. It, it ended in a bad way, but she woke up every day for all that time and said, I'm going to live. I'm going to do this. So as you, as you try to make sense of, of that loss and the pain that leads us to uh, even contemplating that kind of loss, that kind of decision, what would you advise those of us who are currently struggling in that place? So if, if we are the ones there right now and we are the ones listening to the podcast and we're wondering, I don't know if I can make it through this day, what, what advice might you offer? Find anything, anything that will distract you. A lot of uh, preventing suicide in, in a crisis is about distraction. That's one of the big things they teach you is just talk somebody, talk somebody through it. Let's listen to what they have to say. Um, ask how you can help. And, and if you're, if you're, in that moment, it's, it's harder in that moment, but to be like, what, what can I do to just kind of get my mind mm -hmm. off of this for a minute? And we have something called a RAP plan. It's a wellness recovery action plan. 
Uh, you can find it on the internet. It's it's more of a, a formal situation. But for me, I have an informal rap plan. It's like when I'm having suicidal thoughts, what do I do? I tell somebody. And for me, that usually means I tell somebody on social media. Like I, I post it publicly because that a, a lot of people don't function like I do. I'm a, I'm a chronic oversharer, <laughs> but I tell people, I say, look, I'm having suicidal thoughts. It's not fun. Send kittens or something, you know, like... <laughs> It holds me accountable and then people are also checking in with me and I'm letting them know that it doesn't, it is serious, but Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be so serious. They don't have to be afraid. And that's why I say things like send puppies, send kittens, send a stupid (laughs) meme or something. So they're still checking in with me. And that's a good thing because that's tying me to life. I tell my wife. And, and then I move on. I say, okay, if, especially if I'm alone, like, what can I do now? Can I, can I play with my dog? I have a son now. I haven't really had a suicidal crisis with him around, but I imagine he would also be a part of that plan at some point. It's like, well, what can I go do with him? I have a, a list of movies that I watch. And this all seems so trite, but it, it, it really is the little things, I think, that get you through a crisis. And then once you're beyond that point where you're not panicking, right? You can go, okay, what do I need now? Do I need to go to therapy? If yes, maybe I have somebody help me make an appointment if I don't have a therapist. Do I have, do I need financial help? Okay, what is it that I need? You know, do, do I need legal help? Like just how do I reach out? And like I said earlier, we've always tied it to mental health and it's not necessarily always the case. So we have to think of other ways to, to get help. And I think that's a big part of what suicide prevention is lacking. There's so much of a focus on on that mental health that it's like, no, we need to pull in everybody. Mm. I'm working toward that end. We are, I think, expert in our community at talking about weather and sports and traffic. And uh, if we agree politically, we're great at talking about politics. If we don't agree, we don't talk at all because we're no longer friends. But we're very, very, very weak, I think, at talking about the stuff in life that matters probably most, including life and death. And uh, you are stepping into this conversation. So for those of us who know in our network a friend who may have in the past attempted suicide, how can we be a better friend to that person? You know, reach out. Uh, a lot of people who have, who struggle with this stuff, uh, do they do kind of cue us, you know? They do let us know. Uh, a lot of our responses are fear-driven, which makes total sense. I'm, I'm afraid of losing any of my friends to suicide. I'm afraid of losing myself to suicide. No matter how many conversations I have about suicide in my life, it is always scary. I'm never going to be comfortable with that conversation. But if you know that about a person, reach out and say, hey, are you, are you okay? Just checking in. A lot of what we see in the wake of media stories like Chris Cornell um, and Robin Williams, we post a lot on social media. of Like, oh, if you're suicidal, just reach out. I'll talk to you. And the onus, the, the, it shouldn't be on the suicidal person. It should be on, on both ends. You know, if you know that someone's struggling, check in with them. And it's hard to do. Sometimes you're not in a position to do it either. You know, you're struggling with your own stuff and that's also okay. But, you know, if you're there, if you're emotionally available and, and willing and ready, just say, hey, what, what can I do? Are you okay? Let's go out and have a drink, a coffee, a beer. Let's go hang out, go to the movies. Like, I love to go to the movies alone. <laughs> you know, let's right. go do some. Or can I wash your dishes? A lot of people... We all, I think we all have trouble asking for help, but especially when you're, yes. when you're suicidal or depressed or kind of just, you're feeling ashamed, you're, you're worse at it. So having someone come in and help is, is really huge. Desiree, you have, you've met with many, 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 many hundreds who, uh, who live over here, but you've actually photographed and told the stories of almost 200. What have you learned along the journey of live through this? What has it taught you so far? Uh, the main thing it's taught me is that we're we're all so, so, so different, but we all struggle with the same stuff. You know, life is life and life is hard. We have to be there for each other as best as we can. Isn't that amazing to you? Like, with all of the v- differences politically and gender and upbringing and social economic and all the things that in quotes divide us, in your 200 conversations, I would imagine that you've, almost only found things that unite you. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to pain and it comes down to 
the suffering. And I think that we can all relate to that no matter what, you know, when you start talking about suicide and mental illness and diagnoses, people get a little spooked. But when you talk about pain, that is something that, that we all know to some extent. I, I really think that one of the things that will start to ch- turn the tide when it comes to understanding suicide is, is just thinking about it in that basic human emotion of pain. When people tell me suicide is selfish, which you know you hear you hear fairly often, I say, okay, but what would it take? Put yourself in their shoes. What would it take for you to think about ending your own life? Like what kind of pain must you have to be in? And then further to plan it and then to take that action. And and that kind of makes people step back and go, Oh, all right. It's about pain. Do you think there's power once you discuss that pain and own it and then not only own it individually and then you know burn the piece of paper but own it with a person seated across from a a coffee table hearing your story and seeing your face and being part of the story with you do you think there's power there oh absolutely i think there's power in, in in sharing any kind of vulnerability especially that one that has a lot of shame tied into it uh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's very powerful. And I've heard that from people too, you know, like I've never told this story before the first one I'm telling it to. And, and afterwards they're like, Oh, I feel better. I feel like, I feel like a weight's been lifted. Right. It's, it's true. Anytime that I share something that I've been struggling with, I feel better because frequently the response is me too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you said earlier, and I cannot tell you how many conversations I've had with people in really weird situations where, you know, you'd think suicide wouldn't come up, but it does. Like at my bachelorette party and some guy came up to me and start, started chatting with me and he asked me what I did. And I said, I work in suicide education. And he said, one of my friends just died. <laughs> and so we had this long conversation about it. And then I was opening a business bank account once and the banker said, what, what do you do? And I told him, and he said, me too. I can't really talk about it because I'm working, but me too. I got a, a Bernese Mountain Dog a couple of years ago. Dog I'd wanted forever. I, I've always had rescues, but she's my my purebred. I talked to the, the, the breeder and I said, hey, can you hold her for a couple more weeks? Because the puppy was, was due to come home in September and September is National Suicide Prevention Month. And I tend to travel a lot for speaking engagements then. And I said, can you just board her for a couple more weeks for me? I I have to have to do some traveling for work. And she said, I lost my son. Mm. It comes up all the time in so many different contexts. When you set out on this work and you travel to the coffee shops and you go to their homes and you go around the country and around the world to hear their stories and then to free us to learn from their stories, what do you hope that those who are sharing might receive from it? And then what do you hope the rest of us who are just tuning in and watching and observing might receive? When it comes to the people who are, are sharing, you know, I just want them to know it's okay to talk about it, that they're not alone, and that there's always going to be someone on the other end of, of a conversation who who will understand if they just keep talking about it. You know, like, it's not an easy thing to talk about. And sometimes the person you choose might not be the right person. If you keep trying, if you keep trying, looking for someone to talk to, you will find someone. People on the other end, you know, I originally, I originally started this project for attempt survivors. I just wanted people to know they weren't alone. And as the project aged and evolved, I found that the suicide prevention community was really interested in it and that suicide loss survivors were really interested in it and that researchers were interested in it, social workers, therapists. Now it's being used as a teaching tool. You know, we expect our, our mental health clinicians to be well-versed in suicide, but they're not most of them because suicide-related coursework is somehow not mandatory in a lot of those programs, which to me is mind-blowing. Researchers are finally involving attempt survivors. You know, they're saying, what kind of questions should we be asking? Um, Because we have always kind of historically studied people who have already died by suicide. And they're involving us in their research. Therapists are sharing it. The fact that therapists are sharing it is is mind-blowing to me. It's just like, wow, you're using this. You're using this thing as a tool that was originally meant to be an art project. That's, wow, doing exactly what I could have hoped 
for it to do, but never would have because I thought it was too ambitious. Is there an email or phone call, an anecdotal conversation that you had with a friend, colleague, stranger that is now looking back on the journey you've been on, one of your favorites? And I don't mean the story they shared. I mean, because of seeing what you created online, something that was stirred or moved within them. Mm, I think that would be seeing my family change their views on suicide a little. We have a history of various diagnoses and struggles in my family. Um, And I remember when I was a teenager and when I first started struggling, I was really invalidated by them at a time when I really needed them. And they were like, stop crying, suck it up. Your teenage problems aren't real. And so I struggled alone for a long time, for many years. And I have have two brothers. One is 15 years younger than me and the other one's 13 years younger than me. My middle brother, he's a lot like me and he struggled. He's, I'd say he struggles worse in a lot of ways. And one day he, he asked for help. He asked my mom for help. And my mom said, what do I do? You know, how do I help him? Nobody asked that question when I was struggling. So to see that, to see that change was, was really huge for me, you know, because it's, I, lo- I love my brother, you know, and I, I, I love people. But to see, to be able to see that huge change happen just because my mom follows my work and, and she watches and she listens. And so even if we're not necessarily having conversations about it along the way, she's paying attention and she's changed. My brother, when that happened, I think he was 17 or 18, maybe a similar age, which was nice to see because I think, you know, we we love to talk about teen suicide, teen suicide in the media because I don't know. I don't know why people think teen suicide is more tragic than anyone's suicide. But one of the things I noticed is that we don't talk about how complex the emotional inner lives of, of young people are and how. You know, they may not have adult problems, air quote, but their problems are very real and they're very intense because often they're experiencing these things for the first time Mm. and they don't know what to do. And, you know, if they don't have somebody to guide them through that, of course, it it could be too painful to continue to deal with. It was so nice to see that validated in him when it couldn't be validated in me. You know, you... You hear numbers like 1.4 million attempted suicides, and it's almost easy to shrug and and move on with your day. What your website and your movement lived through this has taught me and inspired and the rest of us is to slow down long enough to recognize the power and the beauty of the individual story, the face, the past, the present, and this, uh, this untapped limitless potential within each of their lives still. It's really been inspiring to learn from your work. And Desiree, in in all of our interviews, we've asked all of our guests seven questions that tethered them all together. We call them the Live Inspired Seven. And the very first question is, what is the best book that you have ever read? Oh, the best book. My favorite book (laughs) is The Perks of Being a Wallflower. Um, I don't know if it's the best one, but it's my favorite. And it's it's stuck with me over the years. Tell me about it. I'm not aware of it. The Person Being a Wallflower is, it's about a boy named Charlie, that's a pseudonym, and it's all written in letters to an anonymous stranger who he thinks might understand what he's going through in his first year of high school and how he struggles and and what traumas he's been through and, you know, how he makes friends. It's just about his life. And there is an element of suicide involved and there's some sexual abuse involved, but it's just this really beautiful, simple story of powering through. There's a moment where he and his new friends are are driving through the tunnel in Pittsburgh. It's the one that opens up and you see the whole Pittsburgh skyline. And I got to go through the tunnel for the first time about a year ago. And it was just as magical as I thought it might be. They're in the truck and they stand up. One of them stands up in the back of the truck and they act like they're flying. It was all very dangerous. It opens up and it's like he says, "In, in that moment, I felt infinite. And to me, that was just such a a magical thing. You know, you struggle and struggle and struggle. And then there are these moments in life where you're like, oh my God, this is why I'm here. I feel infinite. I love that book for that. We don't recommend standing on top of the old Chevy coming through the tunnel into Pittsburgh. But the idea of flying into life, feeling infinite is one we all ought to feel a lot more than we we probably do on a daily basis. So Desiree, what's one positive characteristic, one trait 
that you possessed as a child that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? Um, curiosity. Huh. Um, no, not curiosity. The, the, the persistence to seek out the things I'm curious about. I just don't have as much time or energy. Uh, you know, I get, I get curious about something, I Google it, and five minutes later, you know, the, the thought's gone. Or maybe I get curious about more things these days and I can't focus on one thing. But I think the ability to focus on one single thing to the point of obsession mm-hmm. uh, where I can learn about it, I, I think I would love to exhibit more today. You know, I taught myself HTML when I was 15. Oh. I could never do that now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you could. It's just a matter of if you if you uh, have the time between your interviews and your crazy schedule. Right. Uh, but I, I hear you loud and clear. If, if your home caught fire and your family is all out safe, your animals are all out safe, everybody's out, and you have an opportunity to run in and grab one item, what's the one thing, that one item that you would return with? It would have to do with photos. Yeah, photos. Yeah, yeah. Some assuming I had a, a nice organized parcel of of family photos, that would be it. <laughs> if you could sit on a bench overlooking a beach and have a long conversation with anyone, living or dead, who would you want to have seated next to you on that bench? My wife. What would you uh, What would you be talking about? Anything. <laughs> um, I love talking to her. She's my favorite human being uh, and we teach each other a lot and I just love I love having that time uh, and you know the older you get the more complicated life gets sometimes those, those moments don't get to happen as often as they used to I would always welcome more time just talking to her what is the best advice that you've ever received I don't know uh, some version of, of keep going you know that's, that's really trite but I think it's so useful to, to just have that reminder of, you know, things, things take time. I remember at the beginning of my project, I wanted it to move more quickly. I wanted people to like pay attention. And it took three, four years for that to start happening. Mm-hmm. But there was, there was a need for that time. There was a need for me to process what I was doing and to learn more about it. And, you know, to change my, uh, my conception of, of what it was and, and to seek people out and have more conversations. Um, so keep going is useful in various contexts. And I guess also tied with that would be trust your gut. Mm. You know, they're cliches for a reason, but this experience of um, going through infertility treatment and being pregnant, uh, now that I'm at the end of it, uh, I really feel like trust your gut was a huge one that I didn't listen to and I should have. What would you tell your 20-year-old self? She had a rough time. <laughs> <laughs> I would tell her that her life is going to be a lot more interesting than she could ever hope for. That's awesome. And I hope everybody hears that right now loud and clear, regardless of your age or how things are going. It's going to be interesting, and I think it's going to be better than what you can currently even imagine. So the final question to Desiree stage is this. It has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. Desiree Stage, how would you like your one sentence to read? Mm, She did good stuff. (laughs) Desiree, you have done (laughs) some good stuff. You have lived through this and you are reminding the rest of us that we can too. And I'm, I'm grateful for your work, certainly grateful for your impact and grateful for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This was fun. My friends, that is Desiree Stage. She is the leader, the innovator, the mastermind behind the Live Through This Project and Movement. I am John O'Leary, and today is your day. Live inspired. Well, guys, if you enjoyed this discussion as much as I did, don't miss my Monday motivation essay. I'll reflect on my main takeaway from today's discussion and send it directly to your inbox so that you can begin your week just right. I want you to go right now and sign up at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash Monday hyphen motivation. One more time, it's johnolearyinspires.com forward slash Monday hyphen motivation. I'll include a link in the show notes. See you there.